Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining us here tonight. Uh, my name is Relina Joseph, and I am the director of the Center for Communication, Difference, and Equity. Um, and I'm a, a, an associate dean in the graduate school. I just saw my boss, uh, Dean uh, Joy Williamson, lot right here, so I, I better say that, <laughs> associate dean of equity and justice. And I'm a professor in the communication department. And I'm so thrilled that you all are here for our first radical listening session um, that is in this space. We used to have them quite regularly, but since, um, since COVID, we actually haven't had one here since the winter of 2019. And um, I'm thrilled to be here with the person who actually did all of the logistics, all of the planning, Mr. Josh Griffin. Yes. Thank you all uh, for coming out. It's great to be able to put the, uh, the faces to the emails. Um, and just, yeah, looking forward to be able to spend the evening with you in an intentional uh, setting. So uh, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Josh. So we're gonna take you through a number of things today. You're gonna to have an opportunity to listen to some really wonderful clips. Um, we have, for the last number of years, been working on this project. You're gonna hear a little bit more about it in just a minute. And we're really thrilled to have so many of the participants from our project who are here tonight. Um, you're gonna hear a bit from them. And we're gonna do a little bit of kind of mini teachings around some of the things that, um, that are really important for us tonight. So without further ado, should we yeah, get started? Yes. Um, one of our research assistants is going to come up and uh, read a land acknowledgement for us. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out today. My name is Jacqueline Jimenez Romero. I'm a senior at the Journalism Communications Department. And I just want to thank you all for coming tonight. And before we get started, we're going to quickly read the land acknowledgement. So the University of Washington acknowledges the Coast Salish people of this land, the land which touches the shared waters of all of the tribe and bands within the Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. And one more thing that I also wanted to add that wasn't included in these slides is a labor acknowledgement. Um, and this is a new tradition that we started in the Latino Student Union. Um, and so... I will get started with that one. Um, so the labor acknowledgement is um, acknowledging the country's development and growth, um, and that was built on the history of enslaving and oppressing black individuals. These folks were trafficked, treated as chattel, and oppressed through laws such as Jim Crow, and we will forever be indebted to the slavery forced upon them and the violence they endured that continues in this country to this very day. Um, so hopefully with these land and labor acknowledgements, you all can acknowledge the spaces that we currently occupy and continue to still be a part of. So yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. And Jacqueline has played a really vital role in our undergraduate group and reviving our undergraduate group. Um, and, um, and we have all kinds of events for people who are for undergrads in the space who might be interested to come and find Jacqueline and hear a bit more about those. So um, this project that you all are going to see a little bit about today is part of our Interrupting Privilege project that began in the fall of 2016. So those of you all who happen to remember that fall, um, we had a community that was really kind of torn apart in lots of different ways. And part of the way that we wanted to address this was to bring people together to have um, intergenerational conversations around race. And so we began as an experiment through the Alumni Association. So the Alumni Association provided our group of older folks, and we had some undergraduates and graduate students. You could see our spaces kind of look like this initially. So we launched in the fall of 2016. We began recording conversations in the next year with um, one of our PhD students, Anjali Brecky, who did her dissertation on this work and wanted to really have um, create a database for us. We have a beautiful database, and we're going to see some clips of it in just a minute. And, um, and to really hold on to the stories, because the stories were what people kept coming back to. So while we wanted you know, to make sure that we had the fleeting moments of connection, and we're going to have some of those tonight, we really wanted to um, make sure that we were upholding the values of our center, which is um, 
uplifting minoritized voices and voices that are not heard enough and that are often silenced. And so that's what we did um, both in our sessions here together and um, through our recording and through our database. And so we have continued our tradition of having both um, interracial, intergenerational race conversations. And then in the 2019-2020 school year, we received some funding to be able to expand and have them in an intraracial fashion at the Northwest African American Museum, where we had some black community conversations around, um, around race. And so you can see here are all of our different um, themes of the year. Our themes have been um, really responsive to what our community has wanted. So for example, we started in 2019 at NAM doing our Black in Seattle program, and that was in collaboration with um, a local high school, uh, community college, and University of Washington folks, as well as lots of local um, uh, members of the, of the community. And then from there, of course, we hit COVID, and our next year became Quarantining While Black. Right, not something that we were planning for, but it was something that we needed to to really kind of create a theme around. Um, that was uh, thematized by one of our graduate students, Jazz Moultrie. And from there, um, people were feeling really exhausted. And so we partnered with Megan Kennedy at the University of Washington's Resilience Lab to think about how do we combat these moments of racial exhaustion. Um, and so everything has kind of flown from each other and, and we're really lucky to um, actually this year be doing an exhibit at the Northwest African American Museum then where we'll be showcasing much of this work. We'll have um, a one day at, uh, on MLK Day and you're gonna be able to see a little flyer about that at, towards the end. Uh, and then in the spring, we're going to be there for a number of months. So um, we're just thrilled that we've had the support of so many different people who, who Josh is gonna talk about uh, in a moment for these projects. Yeah, so uh, the reason you're here is for the UW Pandemics Project. And as you can see, just the scale of, of this project, 46 faculty, staff, students from the Tri Campus said yes to being able to be in paired dialogues um, for 23 hours from last winter and spring quarter. And this evening, you'll be able to showcase, we'll showcase you the clips um, where you can sit and listen, lean in, and hear their experiences. Um, so that's a little high level uh, of this project. Uh, the repository will live on our own website, but then also on the UW Libraries website, and we'll be working with uh, staff there to make that happen. Um, but this. This project could not have been uh, done without our donating units, so thank you very much for that. Um, and additionally, I would like to ask our, our research team, could you please stand up real fast? Yeah, and just thank you because this wouldn't have been able to have been done without all of you, all of your hard work. Um, and thank you to the donating units too, because this, this matters, um, this lives on, this is our legacy. Um, and now we're gonna invite Rolina and Megan Kennedy to lead us through a a mindfulness practice. Excellent. And the one other person who wasn't up there, but really we should um, have had thanking first, is, uh, is Dean Joy, whose idea this was. Uh, Joy is a historian and um, was clear that, that this moment should not pass without us doing some type of kind of commemoration of the moment. So um, thank you to Dean Joy for her support um, and also for coordinating so much support outside of the graduate school, so thank you. <laughs> you can clap for her. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we're going to share a little bit about some of the framing for tonight. Um, one of the really amazing things about being a scholar is just the, the range of things that, that I can very selfishly keep learning about. And I've um, been so lucky to be partnered with Megan in this work. I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of these frames. Uh, so the first one here uh, is uh, Pedagogies of Discomfort, which I'm gonna share a little bit about, and then Megan Kennedy's gonna share a little bit on, um, on distress uh, tolerance here. So, you know, you saw from the topics that we have here, and, and you know that what we're going to go into for these stories of our dual pandemics, uh, and we were very clear as we were doing this project that the dual pandemics were um, not just about the, the disproportionate impacts of COVID-19 on our communities of color, but also you know, what became known um, in many circles as this worldwide racial reckoning. So this understanding about everyday racialized violence that people were kind of coming to terms with. 
And um, the stories that, that we record are often um, full of emotion, sometimes full of tears. Uh, people are paired together in a way that feels safe and comfortable, and of course, they're sharing their stories with us. Uh, but it's, it's hard to listen to them, right? And we want to think about why we're listening to them and what does it do to us. And we're, we're asking you to work on practicing being something called a radical listener, which we'll talk about in just a little bit, uh, which brings us to this moment of discomfort. So, so this work is framed by philosopher Megan Bowler's um, idea, some of you all might know her, of pedagogies of discomfort. And she talks about pedagogies of discomfort as being really that space where people can learn, right? And educators understand this really kind of um, implicitly, and particularly can learn around um, questions of power and difference. Uh, what, what Bowler is really encouraging us to do in her language is um, not to be a spectator, right? Not to be someone who takes in a story, sits on the side, and kind of lets it wash over them, right? She talks about that as being the process of passive empathy. But she says that instead that we should be witnesses, that we should actually allow ourselves to be moved by these stories and that we should be, allow ourselves to be moved into action, right? It's not, again, for um, it swaying your heart for this moment of empathy, which might happen, but it's actually thinking about what types of change making are we hearing are possible from the stories. So, um, so this work is hard, right? In order to be a witness, and she talks about being in these spaces in order to collectively witness, uh, we have to figure out ways that we're also taking care of ourselves. And so that's a bit of what Megan is going to talk about. Thanks, Rolina. Um, I want to just begin by acknowledging that the um, that there's many members of the Resilience Lab here tonight, and we would all say that our work has been made more meaningful by partnering with CCDE and becoming close colleagues and friends. So um, this this work has been Rolina and I being able to be up here and share this kind of um, combined framing together. I think is just a testament to what happens when you put your heads together and partner. Um, across disciplines. So I want to just bring into the room this idea of, we're using up here the idea of discomfort, but um, this idea of distress or discomfort tolerance, which um, comes from the profound work of UW psychologist Marsha Linehan and her work developing dialectical behavioral therapy, or DBT, which you may have heard about. It's become just a world-renowned um, way of helping people cope with stress effectively. Um, and what distress tolerance is, is this ability to be able to become more aware of how our emotions um, work and act and how um, we can be in relationship to our emotions during uncomfortable or discomforting situations. And what we've done between the Resilience Lab and the Center for Communication Differences and Equity is to think about, so how do we situate these practices that come from this idea of distress tolerance um, or, in other words, mindfulness or compassion-based practices, how do we situ situate those practices when we have conversations or dialogues about race, and how do we use those to be able to support ourselves in that moment, um, in that dialogue, um, in, that, in that work together? And so um, many of you have been part of our, um, of our kind of community of practice where we've been really talking to each other about what is the role of mindfulness and contemplative practice and compassion in these dialogues, which we referred to as in our resistance and in our resilience. And those conversations happened um, about a year and a half or so ago and are part of um, the collection of um, dialogues that you can access through the CCDE website if you go under the theme resistance and resilience. So for those of you who were part of um, those conversations, I know Tanisha is here and others are here, um, we have a lot of gratitude to the way in which you helped us understand what practices might be the ones that can support us in those conversations. And that's a continuous learning and journey for us. Um, mindfulness has shown up to be a, a way that really supports us in these conversations or in these dialogues because what mindfulness is is the ability in the present mo to pay attention to the present moment in the present moment like right now what's happening externally me sharing with you and then what's also happening internally like what thoughts are present in your mind what emotions you're experiencing what sensations might be present so you might be noticing things like your heart rate increasing or feeling hot and so it's when you think about mindfulness in relationship to the dialogues, it's about noticing as you're listening what thoughts or judgments or biases are showing up, what emotions are present, what sensations are here, and using that and just observing without judgment what's present for you. 
Um, there's a really amazing thought leader around how contemplative practice supports conversations about race in our own internal work um, called, well, her name is Rhonda McGee. Um, she's a professor of law uh, at the University of San Francisco, and she's creating a, a center for ethical law using contemplative practice. Um, and she has a book called The Inner Work of Racial Justice, and I just want to read two of her um, statements from the book because she really situates why contemplative practice supports this and makes the point for us. So the first one is, Migi says, because there are so many rivers of pain joining and forming the ocean of racial suffering in our times, personal awareness practices are essential for racial justice work. In order for real change to occur, we must be able to examine our own experience, discover the situated nature of our perspectives, and, under this, and understand the ways in which race and racism are mere cultural constructions. And secondly, McGee says, we need help developing the capacity to really be able to listen to the different stories of others with compassion, to have conversations across lines of real and perceived difference that help us heal, that help and heal rather than hamper and hurt. So in other words, uh, McGee is talking to how mindfulness helps increase our capacity for empathy in these conversations and compassion. I want to... Um, provide an opportunity for us to get situated in a more contemplative way before we start listening to the dialogues. And so I'm gonna invite you to participate in a practice that I'll lead. You can choose to engage in the practice with me or you can just simply observe. It's completely up to you. And I'm gonna sit just so that I can um, get more grounded myself. So what I wanna start with is just inviting you, if you'd like to do the practice along with me, to just find a place in your chair where you can um, just rest your feet on the floor and maybe rest your hands in your lap. In doing these practices um, before a moment like this, if you're like me today, I came skating in here. I came skating in here after having like a lot of meetings in different types of meetings all day. But I wanna be able to show up to listening with a sense of like uh, connection to myself and connection to the other folks in this room and this kind of like really unique and special opportunity that we have. Somebody earlier said to me, this is why I love being connected to the university because of like opportunities like this. And so I don't wanna miss this opportunity. And so for me, just taking a moment to arrive allows me to really get situated and be in a place where I'm gonna be able to listen with more um, effectiveness in a way that is more connected to myself and others and allows me to notice those thoughts and those feelings. So that's why we take just brief moments of arri to arrive before, um, before moments like this. It allows us to take that pause between the day that we just had and this moment and the stories that we're gonna hear. So um, here are the instructions. To begin, if you're sitting in a chair, I would just invite you to adjust your posture so you feel the support of the ground beneath you. Maybe placing your feet flat on the ground, sitting with your spine upright, your head resting in alignment. And you always have the choice to close your eyes if that feels comfortable, or sometimes it's nice to just settle them at a soft gaze a few feet in front of you, maybe finding a speck of dust on the carpet to settle your gaze on. And in mindfulness practices overall, we always can just turn to any point of focus. Sometimes we might have our point of focus be just noticing our feet on the ground, noticing how we're sitting in our chair. Just some point in the body where we can rest our minds and soak in the awareness of the experience of the moment. But because the experience of breathing is at the center of our body's natural ability to manage stress and emotion, a lot of teachings recommend beginning mindfulness with a focus on the awareness of breathing in our bodies. So let's begin by taking a few deep breaths. Paying attention to the flow of the breath as we breathe in and out. And just allowing your breathing to settle into an easeful, comfortable rhythm and pattern. If it helps, you might locate a particular place in your body, like the, that, like the experience of your chest rising and falling as you breathe in and out. It's 
And then next we're going to direct our attention to listening just as a way to warm up our capacity for mindful listening. So first, just by focusing on the sounds around us. Breathing slowly and just focusing on the sounds that we hear in the room right here and right now. You might be noticing the sounds of students in the hallway, the sound of the projector, the fan behind me. Whatever sound is around and close to you, just pay attention to it, letting the sound just appear. Letting the sound take you by surprise. Seeing for a moment if you can pay attention to just one sound. And if your mind wanders, giving it permission to do so. And then finding your way back to listening and breathing. Let's take another three breaths and just notice more sounds. We can take another deep breath in and let it out. Slowly taking a few more breaths in through the nose, out through the mouth. Spending a moment relaxing your feet and your legs. Relaxing your stomach and your chest and your shoulders. Feeling your body breathing in and out. And just sitting in awareness of the sensations in your body as a whole. Allowing that which is good and well within you to be known and felt and appreciated. And when you feel ready, you can slowly open your eyes and let in the light of the room. Be gentle. You might move your body around a little bit if you feel the need. And offer gratitude to yourself for the practice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Megan. So Megan's practice really primes us perfectly to enter into the space of radical listening. Uh, Radical listening is an idea um, that was presented by a critical pedagogy scholar by the name of Joe Kinchlow. And what he is trying to help us do is to uh, listen in the most attentive ways that we can possibly to really hold on to the words that we're hearing, to be conscious of when our own thoughts are coming in to evaluate, to clarify, to question, to even validate, but instead to just hold the words as we're hearing them and as they're coming to us. So I am excited to, um, to present. You saw our, some of our graduate students, I think, in communication. I'm a little biased here. But we do have the best graduate students, and particularly in the CCDE. And you're going to hear from a number of them here today. So our first two are Laura Irwin and Julie Fang. And um, these uh, two um, incredible uh, scholars have really been responsible for um, for Laura's end for actually creating the um, our database, and for Julie's end for populating it tremendously. And so you're going to hear a bit about um, the project from them, and they're going to set us up for the first clips. Thank you, Dr. Joseph. Um, It's been a huge honor and joy to be part of this research team and the CCD community. Um, Before we get into it, um, I want to share a little bit about um, the methodologies that this project has used. Our interrupting privilege and radical listening methodology uses dialogic interviews in which two participants are paired to have a conversation, um, thus interrupting the traditional power dynamics between interviewers and interviewees. These interviews can be between two people who have already had a relationship with each other, um, or they can be two strangers who might share an identity or an experience. 
Um, they're loosely structured, gently facilitated, um, and can last between like 30 to 90 minutes. Um, we then record, transcribe, code, and clip all of these interviews, um, and our database is truly huge. Um, and then the participants themselves get the opportunity to read through it, strike out, or emphasize any part of their story. Um, and we honor their choices throughout this process to either remain anonymous or not, um, and to, if they feel the, the call to, share out in radical listening sessions such as this. Um, in our process, we emphasize consent, equity, and empowerment. Um, so now let's get into it. Um, the theme of our first two clips um, is, I was hustling, but I was also struggling. Uh, our first clip is um, doctors' perspectives of COVID testing. In this clip, the doctors who identified COVID-19 in the U.S. discussed their experiences with running Husky tes testing during 2020 and 2021. Amid supply shortages, they had to be creative and find new ways to provide testing for the community. The second clip that we're gonna be listening to is, uh, I was hustling, but I was also struggling. Um, in this clip, we're gonna listen as first-gen UW students share uh, the numerous factors that weighed on her during the pandemic. As the eldest daughter in her household, she received significantly more responsibilities at home caring for her younger siblings. Additionally, she experienced a lot of pressure from school and working multiple full-time jobs at the same time. So let's go ahead and take a listen to both of these clips. The 2020-2021 school year, um, you, started, you started Husky testing. Oh yeah, yeah, we started Husky testing. Um, so that's when we were asked by the university to start running the, a program to test everybody for COVID. Um, and that was interesting. That was very, that was a lot of work to get that operationalized very, very quickly. Um, but, you know, it, the lab processed so many samples. <laughs> yeah. So, so. For, yeah, and for me, just it was just the, the challenge of keeping all of this going with the supply chain problem, yeah. right? Yeah. We, we couldn't get the swabs and then we couldn't get extraction reagents and we couldn't get anything, right? So we were just constantly like, scrambling um, to try to keep everything open, keep the testing open for the students uh, at University of Washington, keeping testing open for the community of Seattle. Um, and it just required, you know, a lot of creativity and a lot of reinventing things kind of constantly as we ran out of tubes and this chemical or that chemical or this swab or that swab. Um, and, you know, kind of constantly just reinventing the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. I remember seeing the plastic swabs for the first time that we used and thinking how crazy it was that we were switching to this. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then also that was when we started doing self-collection of swabs mm -hmm. on that year um, that we switched over from having somebody collect the swab to having people collect it themselves. And that was also crazy because up until then we weren't allowed to do it really, mm -hmm. uh, except in a research way. And so the fact that it th that became sort of standard of care so soon. I remember being on the phone with the FDA and people were like, they're going to stab themselves in the brain. We're like, no, they won't. Yeah. No. <laughs> we have we have a lot of data that says people can do this just fine. <laughs> yeah. And now, you know, just think about it. The, the population is so used to swabbing themselves now. Um, and we were literally on the phone with the FDA being like, they're saying no. And we're like, you're kidding. This is ridiculous. Yeah. And now it's just common. Yeah. So many things. So I, home testing was yeah. awesome. Yeah, we weren't allowed to do that um, because it was considered to be impossible for somebody to test themselves and get a result. Now you can just go to a drugstore and pick it up. When I went to college, it got cut short in freshman year. But like I had went home, I had missed my family. I was like really like homesick. But then when I had went home during COVID pandemic, it was very toxic for me. Well, like, you know. Because I'm the oldest, I have a lot of responsibilities uh, for my siblings. And so my parents put a lot of pressure on me to do this, do that, and still balance college on top of that. So it was kind of hard with the aspect of, like, being um, away from 
your family, kind of, because I grew up in a big family. I don't know if you grew up in the same, kind of, but um, I had to work, too, at the same time, go to school, had to, like, take care of my siblings who were, like, 10 years younger than me. Um, You also worked? Yeah, I did work, a full-time job. Where? How? Oh, my God. I worked, I worked like a lot of places, like, so I have a lot of skills is what I like to say. So I worked at the airport. I worked at Amazon, um, even worked at an office job for a little bit. I worked at Planet Fitness all in the span of the pandemic, pandemic time. Girl, you were hustling. I was hustling, but also I was like struggling at the same time. I was just like, um... In Pacific culture, the women do everything. I think that's in every culture, and I just hate that gender role. But, yeah, I was just struggling, and my grades reflected that. And so I was, like, SNS every class that I would be in. And also, after the pandemic, I had switched my major, too, from biology to American ethnic studies. So that was kind of a hard pill for my parents to swallow because they had wanted me to be a doctor and save the family. I don't know. I was also a first-generation student, so that was kind of all new to me. And also, like, navigating through college wasn't really something that I knew or either my parents because they both had dropped out of high school very young to have me, and I felt like I had to repay them in some kind of way. But, yeah. Mm, Okay, I I definitely relate because even though I wasn't... I started my... Uh, what's it called? My first year at UW online. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and even though I'm not the oldest, I'm the baby. So I'm the spoiled one. <laughs> so you can hate on me because of that. But definitely it's kind of like the responsibility of um, having to manage um, paying for your our own education, having to at the same time have the good grades. And then also my situation um, was kind of similar of like having the financial responsibility because my mom um kind of like struggled with like an injury at that time mm-hmm. so I was along with my sister we still are the breadwinners of our family so that mm-hmm. kind of burned me out a lot <laughs> and all right those were our first two clips um I'm gonna go ahead and have Alina come on up here and facilitate uh, a turn to talk. All right, so um, if you could uh, just turn to the person who is next to you. Usually when we have these radical listening sessions, the only question that we ask is, what did you hear? So we're gonna do this pretty quickly. We have um, a number of different uh, stories we wanna make sure that we're getting through. Um, What did you hear? What did you hear from the experience of these doctors who discovered COVID? And perhaps some commonalities with um, these first year students who are experiencing their first year of university um, online. So we'll start off. Josh is going to time us. Um, introduce yourself to the person next to you if you don't know the person next to you and you're just sharing out one at a time. What did you hear? Let's go ahead and uh, switch it up, if you can. Yeah. Switch person, switch, yeah, switch person.
Good stuff. Good stuff. We're going to go ahead and, and move on to the, to the next clips. Continue to hold on to these awesome conversations um, and continue them um, as we move forward and, and listen to, to more clips um, and how they register for you. All right. Thank you, Josh. Uh, so we're gonna, we're gonna, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to cut off the conversations. Um, we made a choice to really include more voices tonight. So we would, uh, and other times we have some more time to come together, um, and connect. And we'll have other events as well. We can do some more of that. So we have two more of our graduate students. Those, uh, graduate students that you just saw were, um, uh, second and third years. We have two, uh, brand new MA PhD students here. That's right. Uh, Joel Allen and Mercy Bertero, um, and Joel also um, received his undergraduate degree in com. Thank you for that introduction, yeah. Um, good evening, everybody. My name is Joel Allen. Um, as has been mentioned, I am a first year MA PhD in the field of communication. Good seeing you all today. Um, my hope to, is to study uh, the way that media depicts anti-blackness and media effects and how it works against uh, public opinion or how it impacts public opinion, policy, and quality of life indicators. Hi, everyone. As you know, I'm also a new MA PhD student here in the UW Department of Communication. I come from a background of qualitative in qualitative intercultural communication research. I am now pivoting to intercultural health communication research, so that really looks like community health, uh, health equity work, um, and I'm really excited to do that work, especially in the Health Equity Action Lab that is now part of the CCDE. Very exciting. Okay. Lots of fun things will come from that, um, but I'm very happy to be here, and I'm very, very happy to be a part of the CCDE. Uh, the theme of these next clips uh, is going to be, I'm a whole different person than I was. Uh, we have all seen and maybe have been uh, significantly changed by the dual pandemics of COVID-19 and the extrajudicial uh, and the racial reckoning that has happened because of the extrajudicial murder of George Floyd. Uh, many of us changed how we negotiated spaces, public spaces, how we related to others, and possibly who we chose to relate to. As a result of the pandemics, many changed how they negotiated their own identities and reconciled with parts of themselves in the midst of two life-altering events. In the first clip, a graduate student shares the ways the pandemic changed them. They were forced to stay inside and isolate. This allowed them time to confront their mental health and grapple with the challenges of being an extroverted person forced into introversion. As a black person in the United States, they struggle with the dual pandemics after George Floyd's murder and the face of, and the racial reckoning that the country was facing at home. In the next clip, two faculty of color share how, about how it feels for injustices to go unacknowledged in university spaces. Whether at faculty meetings or in classes, there was a failure to give space to the systemic violences that were happening. And now let's play the clips. And I used to be that person where I'm just like talking and laughing, life of the party. But now it's yeah. like I'm I'm a whole different person than I was in mm -hmm. 2020. And yeah, like you know, and I like one thing I will say because um, mm -hmm. there was the question of how how pandemic has continued to impact my life. When, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm just paranoid now. Mm -hmm. Like, and it sucked because. If you notice during the pandemic, a lot of people like me who are extroverted and outgoing and I was always in something or going dancing or working out and now I'm forced to be in my house and not be around people. A lot of us realize that we were using that as a mask for our unhappiness. Like I started going to therapy during the pandemic because I wasn't used to being alone. I wasn't used to being with my own thoughts. Mm -hmm. And then I realized that I am a, um, I'm, I was sad yeah. and that mm -hmm. the, the things in my life, like things uh, slowed down for me because everything mm -hmm. was always go, go, go. And now yeah. I had those moments to actually sit and the, like, of course, at the same time, there was a, uh, the George Floyd happened and then it was like everyone became aware of the issues of being black in America yeah. and to me I always knew these but now I had that time to sit and talk mm -hmm. and oh 
that messed with me. Like mentally that messed with me. I became mm -hmm. unhappy and sad. So yeah. sad. And also like not naming the moment because during the start yeah. of the pandemic, we had, you know, with um, George Floyd and then also- Maude um, Aubrey, right? Yeah. Brianna Taylor, right? These highly televised uh, incidents of police brutality and, and private citizens and, and lynching. Yeah. yeah. And the rise of, you know, the anti-Asian hate crimes and then right. on and on with the shooting in Atlanta in uh, 2021. And what was so frustrating to me is I remember uh, shortly after um, what happened with George Floyd. And so, you know, before I was here, I yeah. lived in the Twin Cities in yeah. the very close to where, um, where that, uh, where okay. that happened. And People just had a meeting and there's no reference to that. And yeah. I'm just like, why are you having mm -hmm. a meeting and no mention, not even a short acknowledgement? And the meeting was just a waste of time. And they right. spent half of it like, oh, you know, we got to do more self-care. And I'm just like, that's such yeah. a like a, a, a white Karen thing about self-care. It's yeah, like, it's, the, yeah. It's a luxury and it's derived from that really, again, upper class eat, pray, love attitude as if, as if everybody had resources <laughs> as if they have the resources but right and you know and our students felt it too and this is a dynamic before covid and certainly after again more exaggerated because we're all on screen and it's super you know it's right in your face um the lack of acknowledgement about issues of social injustice and and these extreme circumstances that are if they're not impacting you ultimately they're going to right um yeah. The increase in, uh, you know, um, poverty, you know, families really struggling during this time, of course, police brutality and violence against brown and black folks and the anti-Asian violence. The students shared with me how disappointed they were that faculty failed to mention it, right? That it just never came up in classes, even classes that were supposedly developed around themes of DEI and social justice. And, it, and so it's like we had the pandemic and then we had this other you know, ongoing, you know, uh, structural issue that people couldn't look away. I mean, so too, right? I mean, this is why folks reacted to George Floyd's because not because they cared any more than ever before, but because they couldn't look away, right? They were home more often. They had screens in front of them. There had to be some sort of acknowledgement that this happened. And weirdly, people still got to pick and choose when they acknowledged it. So um, we are um, uh, really lucky to have some of these uh, participants who are actually here in the room with us. And so we give them the option before uh, the, the session um, to ask if they would like to participate. And um, I believe some of them said yes. You can always say no now. Um, so if, uh, if anyone who, who, was, who was part of the last set of clips would like to come up and share, we'll uh, invite you to do that. You certainly, you don't have to. Um, part of the reason that we do this is really to kind of bring people outside of the, the space of representation, right? You heard that part of our methodology is really trying to have it be participatory and engaged, but we still have a lot of power in selecting clips. And so we always want people to be able to add any context that they want to. All right, Lando. One of my amazing PhD students, Lando Tosoya, who is here. Uh, I said a third, fourth year PhD. Is that right? Fourth yeah. year. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, the conversation between Hi and I, it kind of it segued to talking about George Floyd, but it all started about how. Um, friendships are formed through the pandemic because at the time he was in Beijing and I was in Seattle and being that I have insomnia, I was up when he was up. And so that started our friendship. And that also started like, you know, us talking about the struggles of being at home and being extroverted people and forced into these boxes of our houses, but also opening our lives through the Zoom camera because I will not blur what's behind me. If it's there, it's there. I don't care. 
you know, if, they, if what's behind me, it's kind of like the back of my hair. It's none of my business. And so um, it was really interesting to be able to sit because I am, I will talk your ear off about anything, cheese, socks, whatever. And it was really interesting to have to sit with my own thoughts and have to realize that this, uh, my extrovertedness was actually a mask of my unhappiness and my insecurities. And then I was like, holy shit, that's why I talk so much. Because I don't want to take that pause and take that time for you to kind of nitpick my thoughts and my research and who I am as a person. But uh, it was interesting taking that first step through like therapy to realize that I had to sit and you know, kind of reevaluate who I was and the person I was before 2020 was just like a masked person. But now this person in 2023, I'm a lot more confident and um, I don't use my talkativeness to persuade people not to notice my insecurities. I use my talkativeness to point out the issues that I find in society and the issues that I've found in myself and kind of push other people like, maybe you need therapy too, so. <laughs> I found my own eat, pray, love. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Please, please come up and and share. <laughs> it, yeah. And so, so we're going to have two of our other participants who will come up and share. The the really amazing thing, the graduate students that you're hearing from, including Lando, um, have been part of this project, who have interviewed, have coded, have clipped. And um, uh, uh, Joel and Mercy and our, the other sets of graduate students you're going to see, um, before they even started the University of Washington, did a summer program to learn this process um, from, from Dr. Carmen Gonzalez and, and other folks. So here, please tell us your thoughts. Thank you. We come as a pair, and thank you all for, for listening to this. And I realized that the bleeping, wow, <laughs> that's just called not code switching. And so I'll, I'll very uh, briefly say that for me it was really about a critical reflection about the intersections between anti-blackness and anti-Asian sentiment as well, because our histories are closely intertwined in terms of uh, navigating histories of racialized violence throughout the nation's, uh, this part of our nation's consciousness is foundational. And so I think for us, it was really about, for a lot of folks in 2020, again, kind of cherry picking what they could acknowledge. And really, it's like people would be like, oh, my goodness, like, are you okay? And it's like, no, nah. right? And that this is, again, uh, I come from folks who were legally denied citizenship in this nation, as well as more recent immigrants. And so it's like, okay, like, really? And, oh, I didn't realize that, you know, all these things. And it was really, really insulting. And so through this uh, intellectual project, it was really uh, revolutionary and allowed me to, and I'm an introvert, and it allowed me to have some what of a voice. And here's my better half of my brain in person. <laughs> oh, I have one. Oh. <laughs> I'll, I'm not going to be as articulate or succinct because I there's a lot I was thinking about at the time that we did the interview, but um, I will say, I said what I meant, and I meant what I said. <laughs> and um, I think, you know, part of our conversation actually was derived from another reflection I'd had with a different colleague um, who was very familiar with my um, space of work and our campus and so on. And we had real concerns about the well-being of women and people of color and our students who were in this new visual space on Zoom, right? And it created a different learning environment and a different kind of containment and self-control to be in that space. And I kept wondering, okay, I'm an introvert as well, and I was very happy to be at home. Thank you very much. But I'm like, why am I so exhausted? Why am I so depressed and frustrated after every Zoom meeting, right? Classes were different, but Zoom meetings with my colleagues and what is going on? And the more we unpacked and talked about it, I was witnessing, or really kind of voyeur, a voyeur too, these very racialized and class dynamics between me and my colleagues where I could not look away, right? Like if we were in a meeting at a table, I could look down, I could check my phone, I could check out, I could turn to a friend and not have to absorb, right? But I was really held captive on Zoom to sort of be subject to some of the privileges of whiteness of um, elitism in the academy and so on. And it was just um, very painful in light of the fact that many of us and probably many people in the room have lost family members to COVID. 
We were teaching sub subject areas where we really had to be pretty steely about sharing data about the inequality that was just like in the news constantly, right? We were mourning for George Floyd and his family. We were mourning for the Asian people who had been targeted. We were trying to correct the media myths that were telling false stories about our communities of color. And it was just, it just like felt like a constant assault and I was exhausted. And so, um, so that's where some of my comments came from because conversely, what I saw was some of my lovely, well-intended colleagues, many of whom were white, um, was a kind of frivolousness right, a kind of desire to do exactly what Lando was talking about, was to bring levity to the situation when that was not warranted, right? Like we needed to grieve, like we needed acknowledgement in a genuine way. And instead there were conversations about going camping to get away and, you know, or a meeting where they started playing games on Zoom. And one of our leaders said, that was the most fun I've had in years. And I'm like, that is such a luxury. Like, how can you say that to some of us when we're trying to hold it together? Our students are falling apart, right? They're working, they're stressed. We don't know what's going to happen next. This has gone on now for two years and you're trying to have fun, you know, and I'm get a yes. It, yes. Amen to self care. Okay. But collective care was not there. And it just alienated us further from that narrative about community in our institution and it was so crystal clear to me what this was really about and what I had either invested in or what I needed to not invest in from this point forward. So I think I brought a lot of frustration to the conversation. There were many bleeps <laughs> because there was so much swearing. I just don't remember that. <laughs> <laughs> and so that just kind of the, some of the energy that I brought to this because I was really in pain and I was frustrated not just for my own communities but for our students too. Thank you. So we'll we'll go ahead and, and move on to our next um, clip so we can have um, two of our um, other first year uh, graduate students coming here. So um, Helen Rosenboom and uh, Grace Rogers are two brand new um, MA PhD students. Uh, who also did um, some of this, this clipping and coding. So thank you so much. Good. Oh. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Helen. Uh, and I'm Grace. And tonight we have the pleasure of introducing these next two clips for our listening session tonight. Uh, the theme of these next two clips is putting in kindness. In this first clip, you will listen as the dean of the UW Graduate School discusses the unique set of intersectional stressors she faced during the pandemic. She shares the frustration and exhaustion from sitting through meetings after George Floyd was killed. As the only black woman dean who was at home with young children, she lived the dual pandemics and often wondered if people around her realized just how much the world changed in the wake of Floyd's murder. Especially for her as a mother, and specifically a mother of young black boys. Her frustration emanated from meetings that ran business as usual and made no room to acknowledge or even understand all the different directions that she was being pulled in. And in the second clip, you will hear from a son who shares with his mother his philosophy behind being involved in BLM. It is a way because George Floyd died and because of all the other people who died, injured, harassed because of what happened, not because of that, but like what happened with segregation and stuff. It, it was very, it was very hard for everyone. Yeah. Yeah, and I really appreciated the way um, the, inter the talk was a long talk, and Josh was so generous to listen to all of it. Um, but to hear all of the different ways that I thought, uh, you know, as a family, I interpreted what was happening, and then how he interpreted it happening. And we took risks, you know, when we marched, we took risks as a family, and it how, and I took risks as a parent, putting my children in that, but what mattered and how he made sense of it and how my, my other son, how we made sense of that as a family and the need for it and the, um, the history of being able to talk about when other people stand in those positions and what that means. 
and that he made that sense of understanding in a different way was really important for me and important for this to be a part of this conversation as an 11 year old. You know, so. Yeah. <laughs> Doing the the whole interview kind of felt it felt it felt good to do it because, I mean, back during COVID, you think, I mean, you go over to your school and say, I don't know, this kid's being mean to you, and like, so you come home, you're like, hey, mom, I need to talk to you, and mom's like, I'm, I'm sorry, I have a meeting, and I'm, I'm not just trying to sing you guys out, but okay. but when but when this happens, it's like, you have, back in COVID or before COVID, you could just like tell your mom this or dad this or sometimes even my brother and and you could just tell them this and they'd be they'd be like oh i understand or i can help you but during covid it was like you needed to do all of this stuff you needed to help your family you needed to do all these things so in with like so i think some of the black, some of the people or like the blm or black lives matter during the time where george floyd died or any of the other people who were injured or harassed or died, they felt like they couldn't be heard because of the skin of their skin color or what they believed in or how they, yeah. And it was, I think it was hard for them to do, to speak because, because like they're talk, they're talking. See, there's a different, there's like, you can talk and people can hear you, but there's a difference between talking and hearing and talking, hearing and elaborating. Because if you talk, if you talk in here, you're like, okay, I know that now. Mm -hmm. But if you talk in here and like tell people about it, talk about it, it being in your mind, being like, you know it, you want to learn more about it, it's going on. I mean, like, this doesn't just have to be phone. You can go outside. I mean, you used to, be, mm -hmm. or you can now go outside. But like, continuing to look at this stuff, continuing to like actually listen to other people's perspectives. Perspectives about it, because you could have your idea about it, but it's you should also value other people's. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So much. Thank you. And I had the um, the incredible honor of being in conversation with Dean Joy. Joy is fine. Yeah. You know, so I'm giving you proper respect here. So before I came, I listened to that clip several times as a way to try and desensitize myself to it. It didn't work. I really thought I had, like, cracked that code. I mean, you're a hard act to follow. I just loved listening to you. I was thinking about my own kids. Um, as a historian, I'm trained as a historian. Like Relina said, I remember being in these meetings. I was in a different university-wide meeting, and just, just like meetings. That's all. It's like, oh my God, we're still like just meetings and meetings. And I said, you know, we and people were depressed and tired. I said, we need to, as a historian, it's like so thinking me and my historian self. We need to record what the texture of this time was like. They're going to see the death numbers. They're not all going to be accurate, but they're going to see that. They're going to see the learning loss for kids in schools. They're going to see all kinds of data, quantitative data. But what we'll be missing is what it felt like to live through it. And that's where the idea for this came from, that we need to record what it felt like to live through that, to continue to live through it. And so my advice to you, I did this at home during the pandemic. I just had a Microsoft Word document because I'm a historian and that's how I roll. I, don't know, I can't even believe some of you graduate students were reading off of phones. I was like, are they actually reading their notes off of their phones? I couldn't do that if my life depended on it. Um, I would just write bullet points. Like I wrote down the last day my kids went to school. 
they were in second and fourth grade, and I didn't know my second grader wasn't an independent learner yet. I'm in education, but I'm a history person, so I was like, why can't you do your homework like your fourth grade brother? Why are you constantly asking me to help? I got a meeting, man. He was like, but I would do it with my classmates. That's cheating. I didn't get it. I get it now. It took me a few months. We're still, we're good. We're good. Um, but to take your bullet points, think about what it was like. Because what happens is all the edges are going to be rubbed off later. So think about like who, you, who you've lost, who you found. Um, what changed? Um, what might have stayed the same? Simple memories, because in 20 years, when you think back on this time, all the edges will be worn off. And so I would encourage you, while the memory is still fresh, like I said, I, I'm telling you, I tried, to, I tried to desensitize myself to that clip. Um, but if you think back, when I was in my little trio and we were talking about being transported back to the time, transport yourself not that far back in history, record it. Doesn't, you, don't have to deter, you don't have to submit it to the CCDE, you don't discern it into the, to the archives, but it becomes part of your own narrative and perhaps a future family narrative of what it felt like because this is, this was a, this is a multi-generational defining moment that we have all experienced and it's valuable to have all of our experiences recorded. So I would just encourage you in the spirit of, of um, being in the academy and um, our voices mattering and recording them to take it up, to do the self-reflection, to do the self-work. It's gonna be hard. Do it in conversation with somebody you trust. I picked her, I could have picked anybody, I picked her. Um, to do it with somebody you trust. It's, a val it's valuable as healing, remembering, and recording. And, and we can actually, um, I love that, I love that suggestion. Um, but we could actually send out with our follow-up materials uh, the questions that we provided. Um, the questions that we provide are really just kind of a set of suggestions. And so some people choose to kind of go through them. Some people pick one question. Some people bring entirely different ones. But we'll send it out as part of the follow-up that you'll receive from us here. So... Um, we, uh, we're trying to be very mindful of our time and our hard out um, in the, from, from the Walker Ames room at, at 8 p.m. And so we did want to share a little bit, come on, come on down here, about, um, about the CCDE. And um, you see a piece of what we do here. Um, our, our proudest work is really with our graduate students. Um, and our undergraduates, um, who really are our lifeblood in so many different ways. And in fact, um, when our wonderful um, UW-Tacoma faculty were talking about uh, students walking around really feeling kind of shell-shocked because of the ways in which faculty were not addressing um, the, the wars that were happening, right? Um, that was why the CCD was founded. So we were founded in uh, 2015 after Michael Brown was murdered in the fall of 2014, and our students were having that experience. They were walking around feeling like there was no space for them, um, in particular a space that would bring together what they were interested in learning about with what they were feeling and who they were. And so we really launched from there. We started with a series of teach-ins and then um, launched our center with, um, with these, these values that, that Josh put together. So right here in the middle is Dr. Carmen Gonzalez. <laughs> And, uh, and uh, Dr. Gonzalez is, um, oh, she's right here. She is the director of this incredible uh, new initiative from the CCDE that we're going to hear about. Thank you. Uh, I'm an associate professor in communication. Uh, this year I'm co-director of the Center for Communication Difference and Equity. And we're just super excited to tell you about our Health Equity Action Lab that we just launched uh, last year. And so this is a space to support and promote community-based research that addresses health equity. As we have seen from everything we learned today, there's such interconnectedness between racial and health equity uh, that leads to racial health disparities, right? So at this lab, uh, we are doing engaged research responsibly, teaching our students how to do this work, 
uh, that takes a lot out of us sometimes, right? So doing it collectively uh, is the best way that we've been able to make this equity intervention in academia. Uh, so stay tuned. We do these virtual roundtables that are live streamed on different topics uh, to really connect researchers and community members to address social issues. Um, so we're really grateful for the space and the lab is within the center. It's one of our main programs now. Thank you. And then as uh, Rolina alluded to earlier on, uh, we have our Interrupting Privilege Museum exhibition that will be happening um, on Martin Luther King Day this year at NAM from uh, 6 a.m. to 5 p.m. Saying thank you, 10 a.m. I need coffee. It's tired. Um, or be a comedian. Um, <laughs> but I want to uh, thank real fast uh, Shannon, Joel, uh, and Marcy. Um, uh, for putting this together. They're spearheading this. They have immense experience in museumology uh, and putting, curating uh, these different um, events together. So we encourage you to come out um, and that'll be, more information will be sent to you all in our follow-up um, email. And uh, Relina is gonna tell you about our exciting uh, Black Capitalism Spring course. I mean, we have so much going on here. You really do. Um, so uh, we, uh, for, for those of you all who are undergraduates um, and graduate students in the space who would be interested in taking uh, Interrupting Privilege class, one of our PhD graduates, Dr. Marcus Johnson, will be teaching this class. It will be uh, Foster. He's, he is a teaching um, faculty member in the Foster School, and it will be um, for Foster and for communication credit. And um, we will be um, pursuing these questions around black capitalism and if you're curious about what that means we actually have a video we have already done a series of recordings with some black business owners in the central district and there's a short video on our website um, that tells you a bit more about what the black capitalism project is so we'll have spaces for people to sign up for that and if you're a community member including um, faculty or staff who would like to come in and be partnered to learn more about what does it mean to have um, intergenerational conversations conversations around race, uh, please, um, please reach out and we will connect you up for this program as well. Yes, um, and here we have a, a QR code, which way, a way you can support um, our center and are also uh, awesome uh, first years, uh, different members of the CCDE. Um, but I wanted to, with the time that we had, tell a quick story. Um, I was in Atlanta um, in the summer of 2020, and it's gonna all tie together. Um, I was at the CNN building uh, when that turned into a riot. I happened to drive from Atlanta to Washington, D.C. Um, to attend the March on Washington. Um, and I stood about 10 feet from Trayvon Martin's mother at the steps of where Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivered his I Have a Dream speech. And I remember actually it's 2023, but in the summer of 2013, I was with Dr. Joseph, uh, one of her undergraduate students um, in Barbados, um, and that's when study abroad. It was study abroad. abroad. Thank you. I want Thank to make you. sure that's clear. Context. I'm starting. To, I'm, I'm. I'm preaching. I feel like a little bit, so I'm gonna slow down. Thank you for the context. Um, as a as a study abroad, right? And I sat there with another black man from Seattle, uh, and we, we we watched the verdict come down um, for for. Uh, Trayvon Martin um, and George Zimmerman got off, right? And so for me, this center is the continual resistance, right? It's going from the, the streets of Atlanta, from uh, Marietta and Centennial, my epicenter, to carrying that over now in this moment. So when you support us, you support this work. You support the resistance, right? To be able, so that we all are in these spaces, in these places, and we know that this is ours. So this, thank you for coming out. Thank you for being here. Um, we'll let either of you have a- I don't have anything else to okay. say, John. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>